Hi, I'm Ms. Raquel from the Center for Puerto Rican Studies Cultural Ambassador Program. Today, I'm going to share a special book, Sophie and the Magic Musical Mural. And while I'm reading this story, please join me by singing along. So first, I'm going to share with you the instruments that we use in the music called plena. So everyone, if they could say plena, plena. plena. Perfect. So the first instrument I'm going to share is a maraca. Everyone, maraca. maraca. Perfect. And we just bend our arm up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. The next instrument we're going to talk about are the claves. Everyone, claves. claves. So the claves goes dun, 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 dun. So this next instrument is called a guido. Let's try that together. Guido. Guido. And this is how you play it. So our last instrument is the pandereta. So everyone, pandereta. Pandereta. And while some people think it might, it's a tambourine, it looks like a tambourine, it's actually a percussion, it's a, a drum. So there's two beats for the pandereta. The first plena pandereta beat is Okay, everyone try. So you hold it on the bottom and you go. And then uh, a second beat that's a little bit harder for me is the tap, slap, tap, slap, tap, slap, tap. Okay, so everyone let's try. Tap, slap, tap, slap, tap, slap, slap. So now that we've introduced all of the instruments, we're gonna go over the song. So there's three songs. Uh, the first one I'm going to teach you is a simple song from Carnaval. Toco, 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 toco. Toco, 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 Be gigante come coco. Be gigante come coco. Toco, 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 toco. Toco, 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 toco. Be gigante come coco. Be gigante come coco. Song number two is Be gigante ta pintao. Be gigante ta Da Mario y Colorado. Da Mario y Colorado. Be gigante ta pintao. Be gigante ta pintao. Da Mario y Colorado. Da Mario y Colorado. Song number three is a plena. La plena que yo conozco. La plena que yo conozco. No es de la China ni del Japón. No es de la China ni del Japón. Porque la plena. Porque la plena. Viene de Ponce. Viene del barrio de San Antón. Porque la plena viene de Ponce. Viene del barrio de San Antón. I'd like to share with you a little bit about one of the figures we find on the cover. So this is a be gigante. It's a figure from Carnaval. So everyone, we're going to try and say it together. So it's called a be gigante. Perfect. And the Bejigante is a character from Carnaval, and he or she wears a mask. So, we also sometimes wear masks. We wear them for which holiday? See if you can think in your head. Anyone pick Halloween? Perfect. Exactly. And so, when it's Halloween, what do we say? We say, trick or treat. Everyone together. Trick, trick or treat. treat. So, our Bejigante is just a trickster, not good or bad, just a little bit sneaky. So I made this little puppet just to share with children what the Bejigante looks like. It has a mask. This one is from Luis Aldea, the mask are from Coconut, and it has three little horns. So let's shake out the wiggles, let's sit crisscross applesauce, let's put on our listening ears as I read to you Sophie and the Magic Musical Mural. Sophie was lying on her bed looking up at the ceiling she was so bored when mommy walked in and said sophie please go to the bodega and get us some milk okay let me get my shoes on as sophie walked into the living room to get her scarf and coat mommy began the usual speech now remember don't talk to strangers go straight to the store and back sophie nodded and wrapped the scarf around her neck. She knew her mom would be watching from the apartment window as she walked all the way to the store at the end of the block. Once outside, Sophie looked at the mural painted on a building. It 
was huge. Even from across the street, she could see everything. Musicians, dancers, tropical fish, a large amapola flower, and her least favorite, a bejigante. She knew that the bejigante was just a trickster who danced around people trying to tap them with a bejiga, a little bag. But when Sophie looked at the sneaky smile on the bejigante mask and its three horns, she was glad it was just a painting. At the bodega, Sophie bought a half gallon of milk and quickly left the store. She decided to cross the street to walk by the mural. As Sophie made her way back home, she noticed how lifelike everything looked. The colorful tropical fish swimming past her in the warm Caribbean sea made the wintry day a little less dreary. When she came to the musicians, the pleneros, she stopped. One had his hand held out and seemed to be inviting her to dance. Sophie put down the milk and said with a giggle, okay, let's dance. Suddenly, Sophie found herself in the middle of Viejo San Juan on the island of Puerto Rico. She was surrounded by the music of panderetas, maracas, and guiros. Well, what's going on? stuttered Sophie. Well, you said you wanted to dance, her new friend said. Sophie, too shocked to do anything else, began to dance. Before she knew it, a group of musicians and dancers made a circle around them. They were singing a famous plena song. La plena que yo conozco. No es de la China ni del Japón. No es de la China ni del Japón. Porque la plena. Porque la plena. Viene de Ponce. Viene de Ponce. Viene del barrio. Viene del barrio. De San Antón. De San Antón. Porque la plena. Porque la plena. Viene de Ponce. Viene de Ponce. Viene del barrio. Viene del barrio. De San Antón. De San Antón. Soon, Sophie joined in the choir as she danced. After the song ended, the musicians began to play a song from Carnaval. Sophie didn't even have a chance to catch her breath. Toco, 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 toco. Bejigante come coco. Toco, 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 toco. Bejigante come coco. Out of nowhere came a person dressed in a black jumper with yellow ruffles and a red mask made from a coconut shell. It was the Bejigante from the mural. Sophie tried to make a run for it, but her dance partner stopped her. Don't be afraid, nothing's gonna happen. But Sophie was sure something bad would happen when the scary looking Bejigante took her hand. Sophie wanted to scream, but instead, she tried to avoid getting bunked by the trickster's bag. The bejigante began to spin, 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 Sophie. When the spinning was finally over, a dizzy Sophie discovered she was now dressed as a bejigante. She touched her face. It was covered with a three-horned mask. Her black jumper had a brilliant yellow ruffle. Now, the musicians began to sing to her. Bejigante ta pintao. Bejigante ta pintao. De amarillo y colorao. De amarillo y colorao. Bejigante ta pintao. Bejigante ta pintao. De amarillo y colorao. De amarillo y colorao. Laughing. Sophie started to dance around the church plaza, lightly tapping everyone with the bejiga. Then she opened her arms and began to spin around, ruffles billowing around her. She spun faster and faster, keeping time with the music. Before she knew what had happened, Sophie was above the dancers and musicians. She was flying. 
Sophie looked back and waved goodbye as she left the street party. Everyone cheered as she went soaring through the air. First, Sophie soared eastward to visit El Junque, the rainforest. She heard the gurgling of the waterfalls and the chatter of the parrots. Then, Sophie flew over lush mountain vegetation that seemed to go on forever. After getting her fill of crisp mountain air, Sophie glided south towards the beach, where she could make out the figures of vibrant fish and spiky coral in the sapphire blue Caribbean Sea. The salty water called out to her, and she came closer and closer to the foamy white waves, ready to plunge in. Sophie, what's wrong? I've been calling you and calling you, and all you've done is stand here, staring at this mural. What's going on? Mommy asked, annoyed. Startled, Sophie looked down at herself. She was no longer clad in a colorful Bejigante outfit. Mommy, I'm sorry. Lo siento. I was just looking at the mural and she muttered as she bent to pick up the milk. Sophie took her mom's hand and started walking home. She glanced at the mural one last time to admire her sister's name, Esmeralda Pagan, on the long list of students who had helped paint the mural. Silently, Sophie and her mom climbed up the two flights of stairs. Back in her apartment, Sophie went to her bedroom window and looked at the mural across the street. The pueblo sings, el pueblo cantor. Now, the bejigante didn't seem so scary. Staring at the mural, Sophie could have sworn she saw the bejigante wink. Maybe this really is a singing and dancing town, Sophie said to herself quietly. Then Sophie began to hum and dance a plena, her arms outstretched to her friends across the street. It was so much fun to read this special story with you. Centro pinpoints and expresses what Puerto Ricans are all about. And the journal is unique in that it is the only journal that publishes research articles on the Puerto Rican experience. It holds our history and protects it. And without Centro, all these materials would be in jeopardy. And today I'm going to share with you a book written by Judith Ortiz Coffer and illustrated by Oscar Ortiz. The title is The Poet Upstairs. One day, a poet moved into the apartment upstairs in the building where a little girl lived with her mother. The girl, Juliana, was too sick to go to her first day of school. Her bed faced the window so she could see the street. Who's the lady with all the books, Mommy? She asked her mother, who was getting ready to go to work. Her mother was a nurse for the old people in their building. I heard that she's a famous poet, that she lived on an island like me, Mommy answered. They watched the poet, a tall lady in a red coat and red hat, carry boxes of books and papers from a car. They heard her going up and down the stairs. A writer? Juliana was excited when she heard this. She loved books, and her mother read to her in both English and Spanish. I heard that she's writing a book, hija. We must not bother her. But seeing her daughter's look of disappointment, she added, maybe we'll meet her. But first, you have to get better. After her mother went to work, Juliana heard the sound of a typewriter clicking and clacking and the poet walking around upstairs. She listened until she fell asleep. Juliana had a dream. She dreamed that her bed was floating on a river, a wide river that took her through a grove of palm trees and down a field where cows grazed on green grass. A big warm sun shone on Juliana's face. The currents of air made her feel like she could fly. And in her dream, Juliana did fly. 
She guided her flying bed over a mountain range that divided a beautiful island down the middle, like a brown belt. She drifted over an ocean of turquoise blue water where dolphins leaped into the air and danced as she flew above. When her mother came in to fill her head for fever, Juliana told her of the dream. The mother said, that's a beautiful dream, Iha. You dreamed of my island. I think a happy dream means you will soon be better. I'm going back to work now, but will return to check on you during my break. Call me if you need me. Juliana was alone again. It started to snow. From her bed, she saw people bundled up and walking with their heads down. The cars glided down on the slippery street. There was nothing exciting to see except the mounds of gray slush. The whole world seemed frozen, and Juliana started to feel lonely. She heard the sound of a chair scraping the floor, and then the music of the typewriter keys. Juliana closed her eyes and imagined that each letter the poet typed was a brushstroke, painting a picture in her head. Listening to the sounds of the typewriter, Juliana heard a song inside her head. It was a song in Spanish, a song of a tiny tropical island sitting on the ocean like a green button on a blue dress. It was a song of the red hibiscus flower opening slowly like a mouth about to sing, then curling up tight like a baby sleeping at the end of the day. It was a song of warm afternoon rain showers that washed the world and made everything look brand new and of beaches, of white sands, and of waters the same blue as the sky, like the ones she had seen in a book about the island where her mother was born. Juliana felt better, and when her mother returned from work, she asked for paper and coloring pencils. Juliana did not know how to write all the words, but as she listened to the poet work, she drew pictures of what she was seeing in her mind. Juliana drew a big shade tree with bright orange flowers like a big umbrella. Juliana drew a lake where all the fish shone like stars in a clear night sky. She drew a tiny green frog, no bigger than her thumb, sitting on a palm frond, singing after a rain shower. She drew herself under the palm tree reading a book called Poemas. When Juliana was feeling well enough to get out of bed, she took the drawing upstairs and slid them under the poet's door. The next day, a piece of paper came in under the little girl's door. It was a drawing of a lady wearing a red hat with papers in her hand. And there was another smaller figure and an arrow pointing up a flight of stairs. It was an invitation from the poet to visit her. Julian asked mommy if it was okay to visit the poet. And her mother said, yes, hija. I've met the poet upstairs. I told her that you love books. Gracias, mommy. The girl ran up the stairs and knocked on the poet's door. The poet opened it. She was wearing a large red sweater and a red cap over her black hair. Her fingers stuck out of blue gloves whose tips had been cut off so she could type. It was very cold in her apartment. The heater under the window was not making any noise and the windows had frost on them. Juliana saw a small table in the middle of the room with a black typewriter on it a bare light bulb shone above it. There were stacks of books all around the tiny apartment. I love your poems, Juliana said to the poet. You have read my poems? The poet asked. No, I have not. I have seen your poems in my head and I have dreamed about the pictures you make with words. Yes, that happens with poetry sometimes. Poems can get into your head like songs. The poet took Juliana's hand and led her to the work table. 
I'll show you how I write poems. Sit here next to me. The poet pulled another chair next to her writing desk. They sat down in front of the typewriter. What would you like to write about? She asked Juliana. I like birds. From her window, Juliana only saw the pigeons that roosted on the rooftop and sat on wires. But she had seen pictures of tropical birds with feathers and all the colors of the rainbow in her mother's books about her island. These were the birds she wanted to see when she closed her eyes. The poet wrote, in an island garden, picaflores dart around in circles like flying jewels, emeralds, rubies, sapphires and diamonds twinkling in the sunlight. They hang by their beaks in a circle, sipping nectar from the flowers like a necklace on a queen. As Juliana watched the poet's fingers touching each letter and the letters making words, she imagined tiny sparks of colorful lights flashing off the keys. Think of a big yellow sun shining down on us, the poet said. The room filled with light and Juliana started to feel warm as if the sun were shining right above them instead of just a single light bulb hanging from the ceiling. Can I try it? Juliana asked. Yes, I'll help you find the right keys. What do you want to write about? About a big river. Yes, I like rivers. I know a big river. As a little girl, I would go to this river to watch the fish dancing under the water and to imagine I was a bird following the river to the sea. The poet and the little girl worked together on a poem about a river that leads to the sea. As they made pictures with words, the walls of the tiny apartment melted and outside a great river swelled and ran down the street. The girl felt the desk and the chairs start to float downstream. The buildings became a mountain range and the sidewalks turned into rich black earth. As the girl and the poet worked on the poems, the words became whatever they imagined. Lampposts turned into palm trees, seagulls, parrots, and nightingales. All the birds the girl could have named circled around them. The poet wrote the names of flowers and they sprouted from the rich black earth, orchids, roses, hibiscus, and daisies. A big yellow sun grew brighter and warmer until they had to take off their hats and gloves. When they reached the ocean and there was nothing but blue water as far as they could see, the poet said, this poem is finished. It's time to go back. As she pulled the paper out of the typewriter, the river dried into the concrete of the street. The mountains became the buildings of their neighborhood. As they stood up from their chairs, the wall surrounded them and the sun dimmed into a light bulb again. It got colder as the city in winter returned outside the window. They put their gloves and hats back on and they found themselves back at the desk in the poet's cold apartment. The little girl shivered. She missed being in the poem. The poet said, now you know how to write a poem. First, you have to believe that words can change the world. If other people read this poem, will they travel on the river to the sea too? The journey will be different for each reader. I will not be there to guide them as I did you. What they see may be different from what we saw, but it will still be a poem about a river that leads to the sea. Will you take my mother down the river? The poet lifted the pages of poetry from her desk and gave them to the girl. You can do it. You can take her and anyone else you choose back to the great river and that river will always take you somewhere new. That afternoon, Juliana showed the poem to her mother. Mommy looked out of the window as if she were seeing the world change outside and said, Yes, hija, I know this river. I played on the banks of El Gran Rio 
when I was a child. I can still feel the warm mud on my toes. I used to pretend I was a mermaid swimming to the ocean. Mommy, I have an idea. Let's go to El Gran Rio together. Then the girl asked her mother to help her write a poem. As they put down each word, they felt the power of the river carrying them to every place they imagined. They played on the warm mud beside it and swam together in the river her mother remembered. After she went back to school, Juliana did not see the poet again. She heard the typewriter laid into the night and the words she imagined became part of her dreams. But the poet did not invite her back to her apartment. Juliana knew that she was working on a book of poems and that she should not disturb her. The girl worked on her own stories and poems as she listened to the poet upstairs. She remembered that words changed their world even if only for a little time. One day, Juliana did not hear the song of the typewriter. She did not hear the poet at all. Mommy told her that the poet was no longer in the apartment upstairs. Juliana imagined her floating down her beloved river to another place she wanted to see. After the poet left, Juliana never felt lonely again. The lesson the poet had taught her that a poem is like a magic carpet that can take you anywhere in the world and let you be anything you want to be was a gift that changed her life. When she was older, the girl would read the poet's books. She would find herself in one of the poems as the little poet downstairs. And one day she would write a book of poems of her own and she would dedicate it to the poet upstairs. The first story that I heard from my grandmother's lips, Pereza Martina has been my golden key in opening doors for me everywhere. It is just a fundamentally unique experience to read about characters that you can identify with. If you just read what she published, you would only have a fraction of a very skewed view of what she was writing. Thank goodness we have her archives here. When Julia danced bomba. While I'm reading, I'd like you to join me by singing and by drumming. So before we start, just quickly, I want to share with you a couple instruments in the book. The first one I'm going to share with you is a maraca. So everyone, arms up, and we go up, down, up, down, up, down, up. The next instruments that we have are the qua. Everyone say qua. Qua. Perfect. And we're just going to, in the air, drum. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, one more time. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And the last instrument that we have is going to be the barril. Everyone say barril. Barril. Perfect. So we're going to do the yuba beat. Everyone, yuba. Yuba. And we're going to play the beat. One, one, two, three. One, one, two, three. One, one, two, three. Stop. One more time. Tap. One, two, three. Tap. One, two, three. Tap. One, two, three. Bam. Perfect. And lastly, one more time. Let's say it together. You ba. You ba. Great. And just so that you all know, bomba has five rhythms. So we have guembe. Guembe. Holandes. Holandes. Sika. Yeah. Seis corridos. Seis corridos. And you ba. You ba. Lastly, in this story, we have music. So we have singing. And I'm going to teach you the song. And when we're singing the song during the reading, I want you to join us. Okay? So first, I'm going to say the words. And then you're going to repeat them. And then I'll sing. And you're going to join me. Ready? So we have... Repícame la bomba. 
Repícame la bomba. Repícame la cua. Repícame la cua. Ay, bailame la bomba. Ay, bailame la bomba. Hasta la madruga. Hasta la madruga. Perfect. Okay, so one more time. Let's remember. When we hear the drumming, everyone's going to join me with that yuba beat. One, dun, dun, dun. two, three, stop. Perfect. And then when I sing, you're going to join me singing. So let's get ready to read When Julia Danced Bomba. As Cheita and Julia pushed open the doors to the cultural center, they were greeted by a loud Julia, they're already warming up. Hurry, said Cheita, half dragging Julia up the stairs to the activities room. Once inside, Cheito dropped Julia's hand and ran over to the instruments. He sat down in front of one of the barriles and began pounding on the drum, joining the other boys and girls making beautiful music. Cheito was a natural. He banged on things all week long. He practiced his beats on chairs and tables and even walls. Chita looked forward to Saturdays. He loved bomba class. Not Julia. Julia didn't want to practice dancing. She preferred to play make-believe. Julia loved to daydream about becoming an astronaut. Suddenly, everybody was ready to dance bomba. Everybody but Julia. Julia slowly joined the other dancers, her eyes lowered to the floor. She took her place behind Jamaris to warm up. 16-year-old Jamaris was the best dancer in the group. As the teacher called out the steps, Julia tried to imitate Jamaris, but it wasn't easy. Julia just couldn't focus on the beat of the drum. She was lost. Her right turn was too slow. Her sidestep was too big. And her jumps were enormous. Julia just didn't think she should dance bomba. The dancers practiced for a very long time. Finally, the teacher announced, okay everybody, let's get ready for a bombazo. A bombazo? This was Julia's favorite part of dance class. The musicians would play, everybody would sing, and each of the older kids would dance a solo. Julia loved watching the dancers as she sang. As the students happily began to form a semicircle around the musicians, the teacher called out, I have an announcement. As a special treat, all of our younger dancers will also participate in the bombazo today. A solo, Julia would have to dance in front of everybody all by herself. Oh no. Julia could barely pay attention to any of the others. Finally, it was Julia's turn to dance. Head held high, she slowly strolled into the circle. Stopping in the middle, Julia paused for a moment. She looked at the drummer of the Barril Primo, the main drum. He smiled and nodded to her. Julia inhaled, closed her eyes, and took the first step. Holding the edge of her skirt, she moved her right arm in the shape of a half circle and heard, Neat, whispered Julia, right on the drum beat. Now, eyes wide open, 
and a bit braver. Julia focused on the main drum and made the same movement with her left arm. <laughs> Rang out the drum again, loud and clear. Wow, Julia thought, the drum is talking to me. She began twirling in a circle, raising and lowering, left arm, right arm, left arm, right arm. The main drum sang out, dun, 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 dun. Julia stopped worrying. She finally took a break from trying so hard. Instead, she heard and felt the rhythm of the bomba drums. Julia danced and danced and danced as Jeito sang out in a strong, clear voice. Mama, cuidame Belen, cuidame Belen, mama. Mama, cuidame Belen, cuidame Belen, mama. Repícame la bomba, repícame la qua. Ay, bailame la bomba hasta la madruga. Repícame la bomba, repícame la qua. Ay, bailame la bomba hasta la madruga. The song finished and Julia's dance came to an end. Leaving the circle, she looked over at the musicians and spotted her big brother. Cheito was sitting in the front row, happily pounding on a barril. He looked at Julia and winked. Julia took her place next to Jamaris. Jamaris hugged Julia and whispered into her ear, That was great. I am so proud of you. Julia smiled from ear to ear. She was a natural too. I'm gonna to share a special book, Mayanita's New Friend. We're gonna actually get to meet a number of animals in this story. And can you guess the first one? What is this? What sound does this animal make? When we read the story, you're going to get to meet Pablito. He's a snake. So let's try and make a snake sound together. There is another really important animal in this story. Can you guess what this animal's name is? You guessed it, a crocodile. This is Teresa. And we can put our hands together and look like we're making a crocodile sound. One more time. Chun, chun, chun. There is another important animal in our story and it looks like this what's the name of this animal any guesses it's a jaguar this is rafael the jaguar he's ferocious let's hear your most ferocious roar together Rawr! and then we're gonna get to meet all of these anyone have a guess flamingos together let's say it flamingos and then we get to meet a bunch of these silly little animals they like to monkey around and one in particular is miguel miguel the monkey so let's shake out the wiggles sit crisscross applesauce put on our listening ears as i read to you Mayanito's new friends. Way above the clouds, above the rainforest, high on a mountaintop, Prince Mayanito was looking down at the entire western hemisphere. He observed rain forming in the clouds below. Soon, the clouds sounded like thundering warriors. Within each gigantic raindrop was a child. One by one, the drops landed gently onto the earth. The children formed a circle and each held a musical instrument. A girl from Appalachia held a banjo. A Mexican boy, a guitar. A Brazilian girl, a barimba. 
An Alaskan boy, a flute. A Puerto Rican boy, a guido. A Hawaiian girl, a ukulele. And a Jamaican boy, a shikere. Mayanito descended from his mountaintop to play with the raindrop children. As the sun warmed the land, the raindrop children began to evaporate. Amazed, Mayanito watched as they turned into flowers. Mayanito was sad to have lost his playmates. He gathered all the flowers and began to cry. His tears ran down his face and body and into the village below. When they finally landed on the ground, they transformed into children again. Mayanito decided to go down the mountain toward the village to find his new friends. He climbed into a canoe and floated downstream. The canoe floated to a cave that was guarded by a snake named Pablito. He slithered up to Mayanito and said, Prince Mayanito, I'll protect you from the mosquitoes ants, centipedes, and slugs that live in this cave. Thank you, Pablito. Will you come with me to look for my new friends? Pablito got in the canoe and away they floated. But soon they crashed into a rock and flew through the air. Luckily, they landed on Teresa a crocodile who was happy to guide them through the jungle. Away they went on Teresa's back until they reached a swamp where they began to sink. Miguel, a monkey, wrapped his tail around a strong tree branch and pulled Mayanito, Pablito, and Teresa from the sinking sand. When they were safe on ground, other monkeys arrived with bananas and coconuts and invited them to a feast. It was delicious. As they ate, Mayanito noticed a pair of shining amber eyes staring at them. It was Rafael, the jaguar. Teresita and Pablito went up to the ferocious cat, Rafael, Please allow the safe passage for Prince Mayanito. And Rafael answered, It will be an honor for him to pass through my jungle. They continued on their journey until they came to a giant waterfall blocking the way. Miguel and the monkeys decided to make a hammock out of vines to carry Mayanito through the waterfall. Teresa Rafael and Pablito said goodbye as the monkey swung the hammock from tree to tree. The wind blew strong and rocked Mayanito's hammock back and forth, back and forth. He fell out but was able to hang on to a vine. A flock of flamencos then flew up and caught him just as he let go. All the animals applauded as Mayanito rode a flamingo like a horse. The flamingo set Mayanito down in the village and then took off, circling the people below and dropping feathers as good luck charms. The children were happy as they sang and played their instruments. One of the children handed Mayanito a beautiful drum and he happily played music with them. When the adult villagers heard the music, they joined the celebration. Soon, everyone was singing, America, America. One of the children explained to the villagers, Mayanito is a prince. He lives way, way up there. I saw him when he came down. Another child led Mayanito to their festival. It was the first time Mayanito had seen anything like it. 
he rode a horse in the carousel and went way up in the sky on the ferrisol wheel. He took his first bite of cotton candy and he shot a basketball through a hoop. He enjoyed the bumper car ride and was even brave enough to get on the roller coaster. After the rides, the children sat down at a long table covered with all kinds of tropical fruits and vegetables. Mayanito was happy, but he missed his family. He kept looking up at the mountaintop. His heart yearned to be back home above the clouds. On the mountaintop, there was great sorrow. The men of the tribe had spent all day looking for Mayanito. They returned to tell his parents that they had found the empty canoe at the edge of the waterfall. Mayanito's father and mother were very worried. The next morning, everyone boarded Simone, the inchworm train. They headed up the mountain to take Mayanito home. This would be the first meeting ever of the people from the mountaintop and the villagers from below. Together, they would create peace and friendship between the two people. When the train reached the end of the line, the children clapped their hands in thanks for the fun ride. The flamingos were waiting and invited Mayanito and his new friends to get on their backs. Some of the children were afraid to fly with the big pink birds. But Mayanito said to them, come, let them take you to my home. Mounted on flamencos, the children were amazed at what they could see high above the ground. When they saw a lion in the jungle, they squealed, ooh wee. The birds flew into a dark, large cave and the children hid their heads in the birds' necks and screamed, Ma! The birds finally came out of the cave and into the light, and the children were able to see all the birds of the rainforest flying along with them. In the distance, Mayanito's tribe heard thundering feet and people singing. They saw a herd of jungle animals headed by Pablito the snake. The animals were coming to the mountaintop. The members of the tribe did not know what to do. Then they spotted Mayanito. He was walking hand in hand with the children on his right side and Pablito, Teresa, and the other animals on his left. Mayanito had brought friends to his home. Mayanito's mother and father ran to embrace him. Mayanito's father placed a beautiful crown on his head and led him to the throne. Mayanito was now king. And he declared all the children of the hemisphere members of his tribe and named the snake and the crocodile as official mascots. A joyous celebration of the people and the animals of the hemisphere took place on Mayanito's birthday. Mayanito and his father drew a map of the hemisphere on the ground. Mayanito asked the children to find their countries on the map and play their music. He went to the equator, the exact center point of the hemisphere. He closed his eyes as he listened to the music coming from each part of the map. Suddenly, Mayanito felt someone shaking him. He opened his eyes and woke up in his mother's lovely arms. He had been dreaming. He had never left his home. His mother and a group of village children were singing a Mayan song. They were there to celebrate Mayanito's birthday. As Mayanito got dressed for his birthday party, he wondered, did the raindrop children really exist? 
could he visit them again? He finally, my own way, my own way, anyway. Tato is one of the most important New Yorker poets, but he's also a major poet. He truly captured the essence of so many people who walk the streets of New York that no one sees and no one listens to and no one knows. Viva your tire! You're beaten! You're triste! A surprise for Teresita. So this story is about a little girl on her birthday and she's waiting for a surprise. She's going to receive a surprise from her Tio Ramon. And Tio is Spanish for the word uncle. So she spends all day waiting and wondering. And finally, at the end of the story, there's a box and inside the box, there's a surprise. So this is what the box looks like. And I want you all to just use your imagination to figure out what might be in that box. And also, what you might want for your next birthday surprise. So let's shake out the wiggles, sit crisscross applesauce, put on our listening ears as I read to you a surprise for Teresita. That morning, when Teresita opened her eyes, she knew it was a very special day. Today, Del Ramon would bring her a birthday present. Teresita was seven years old. She was a big girl now. She dressed herself and went into the kitchen where Mamá was preparing her breakfast. Mamá asked Teresita, is it time for Teo Ramón to come to our block? No, hija, answered Mamá. Teo Ramón has to take his snow cone cart to the other blocks before he comes to ours. Teresita sat down to a bowl of cornflakes. As she drank orange juice, she thought of her uncle's snow cone cart. It always made her happy when he came to her block. All her friends would run to him to buy snow cones. He always made Teresita a special one. Today, it was not the sweet ice she thought about. She wondered instead what her surprise would be. When she finished breakfast, Teresita put her dishes in the sink and went to the fire escape window. Mama was watering her plants in the bright sunshine. Mama, did De Ramon say what the surprise would be? Mama turned and smiled. I'm sure that whatever it is, it will be a fine gift for such a grown-up girl. And since you are such a big girl, you can help me water the plants. Teresita watered the plants with a blue watering can. From the fire escape, she could see all the activity on the street. But she did not see Tio Ramon and his snow cone cart. Later that morning, Teresita sat on the front stoop of her building. She waited for her uncle, but he did not come. She decided to jump rope with her friends. Close by, older girls jumped double dutch to all the letters in the alphabet. Teresita could not jump as well, so she played high water, low water. Each time the rope was held higher and higher, she jumped over it. After the game, Teresita looked up and down the street. It seemed everyone was doing something. Mothers held young children by the hand and visited the corner bodega to buy food for the evening meal. Boys and girls rode bikes or played stickball. Grown-ups sat in their windows, elbows resting on bed pillows, enjoying the sights and sounds of the neighborhood. Still, there was no sight or sound of her uncle. Teresita wondered if she could have missed him. Red light, green light, one, two, three, shouted Teresita, leading her friends in the game. As they played, she listened for her uncle, but all she heard was the radio playing in apartments and storefronts. Mothers yelled to their children from open windows. 
Teresita did not hear Tia Ramon calling out, Snow cones! Cold snow cones! Teresita was disappointed. She sat on her front stoop and no longer felt like playing. Soon, Mama would call her for lunch and maybe Tia Ramon would come in the afternoon. Far up the street, she could see water spraying from an open fire hydrant and children playing in the showers. Suddenly, as if it were coming from the giant spray of water, she heard, snow cones, cold snow cones. She could see the green and white umbrella of Tio Ramon's cart. Teresita wanted to run to him, but she knew Mama trusted her to stay in front of the building. Slowly, Tio Ramon inched his way towards Teresita. It seemed to take forever. But finally he arrived. Good morning, Teresita, said Tia Ramon. Would you like a snow cone today? Teresita looked at the cart, but all she saw was a large cube of ice and many bottles filled with different colored syrups. Where was her surprise? As children gathered around the wagon to buy their snow cones, Tia Ramon scraped the ice and molded it into cone-shaped cups. Then he poured syrup over them. After the children left, Teresita looked at the cart again, but still all she saw was the large cube of ice and the bottles filled with colorful syrup. Where was her surprise? Tia Ramon motioned to Teresita. Come closer, child, he said. He opened a small door on the side of the wagon where he kept extra bottles of syrup. He took out a brown shoe box that had several holes on each side. Tia Ramon handed the box to Teresita. She couldn't imagine what it could be, but she did hear tiny scraping sounds inside. She lifted the lid and gasped. A kitten! From inside the box, Teresita lifted the softest, tiniest black kitten that she had ever seen. He had a small red tongue shaped like a heart. Around his neck, the kitten wore a card tied to a green and white ribbon that said, To Teresita. Oh, thank you, Tio Ramon. I will name him Piragua. Teresita put down the box just long enough to give her uncle a great big hug. And when Mama leaned out the window to call Teresita for lunch, she also called Piragua. Teresita and her friends laughed, knowing Mama did not mean the sweet icy cold ones that Tia Ramon made.